You guys hear me? Yeah, cool. Every single day, people hate the momentary anger that they feel in situations when they know that they should keep a level head, when they lash out at their parents and their friends, when they know that they should not do that. When people feel overwhelming thoughts of sadness that prevent them from working, from being able to afford emotional help to those around them who they know need it more. People recognize these facts about themselves every single day, and I think they recognize them pretty damn accurately. That is why in the status quo, people try and work on themselves. People set goals for themselves. People take medication to regulate these emotions in the status quo anyway. We at Opening Government provide them the perfect way to escape the tyranny that their emotions exercise on them. I'm going to do a little bit of setup before getting into two arguments. Few things in by way of setup. The first is I think just to preempt any stupid op arguments about why this is going to be used badly, I think that it's reasonable to suggest that in this world there's going to be a lot of government regulation and oversight of this technology if it is used poorly, if there is some way of abusing the technology. And I think there's also likely to be things like caps on price gouging, which already exists for lots of pharmaceutical things in the status quo, insofar as this is someone that, something that the government presumably has an incentive to try and get to as many people as possible, insofar as it makes them better adjusted, uh, makes them less likely to commit crime and things like that. And so they want to try and make this as accessible to the general population as possible. And, and also because they like want to kind of address skepticism and concerns over this technology because it is a flashy new innovation that a lot of people have become used to. Second piece of setup, who, oh, sorry, when are people going to use this? I don't think that people are going to have these regulators on like all of the time. And specifically, I think there are moments in which people recognize that lots of emotion is appropriate. Like if you go to your dad's funeral and you know you just want to cry in that, in that place, you want to have all of that emotion come out, you want to have that experience, I think that people can recognize that. And for the people that think that's going to be debilitating for them, they're going to keep the regulator on. But for the people that just want to have that experience there, I think that people are just going to take it off momentarily and then put it back on maybe in a couple of days or in a week after they have gone through that process because they think that that's something that's going to be really, really important for them to go through. I think that people are able to recognize these things. Thirdly, in terms of setup, how are people going to customize it? I think that people aren't just going to push, strap on these things and become like soulless zombies, like get rid of absolutely all emotions because obviously people don't want to become soulless zombies and lose all parts of themselves. I think that they're just going to create the settings to adjust to like allow them to exist day to day, right? Knowing their own circumstances and what they need to do on a day to day basis it's just to make the most of their lives right limit things like knee-jerk anger and violent thoughts things like depression and anxiety those things which are severely curtailing to their experience of what is a good life two arguments then from opening government Firstly, I think this is just fucking amazing for people to have. I think this, I think that emotional instability is horrible for people and being able to give them that solution is just really good. And I want to just emphasize like how much of a slam dunk this is, right? And we're not just talking about the worst case scenarios here, but I think that those are incredibly important. People who grow up feeling angry, people who know that they are prone to violent outbursts, who are have grown up feel like with like, you know, maybe in abusive households or just because they've been conditioned in that way, who then lash out at people and know that it's terrible for them. People who have addictive personalities and know for a fact that they are prone to binge drinking alcohol or that they are prone to doing things like taking drugs. We allow those people now to just turn on the regulator and not have any of those really terrible feelings anymore. I think it's incredibly good. But I think it's also just really, really good for everyone on a day-to-day -day basis. If now people are feeling less unstable because unstable emotions are the emotions that people precisely know how to respond to least because they are the ones that are the least predictable and they are the ones that have come up like, you know, in flashes and in times when you can't really control them. When people feel jealous, when people feel too, like, you know, all of those terrible emotions that plague people on an everyday basis, I think that people are able to get rid of them. On the comparative, I think lots of people try and regulate their emotions anyway, but I think on a far, far worse level. Either people take things like SSRIs, which often have crippling side effects for the vast majority of people, and are not as specific to their own circumstances as these regulators, because these regulators, you can basically customize them to your own personal needs, depending on what emotions you know that specifically you need to control, what specific tasks you know you need to get through that week. SSRIs are obviously far, far less able to adapt to those individual people. Or it looks like things like going to therapy, which is often not as effective because it can only mitigate these, these emotional instability because you never know what's going to happen. You never know what you're going to come across in your everyday life that might just spark that trauma or spark those violent emotions that you had tried to put away through therapy. 
Or you just straight up go to things like substance abuse, where people just go to things like alcohol, people turn to things like illicit substances, because those are the only things that actually are work, have worked to try and suppress all of those emotions that they know are bad for them. The weighing of this is incredibly clear. We help literally millions of people around the world in their everyday lives. Every single interaction that they have is more fulfilling for them, is one step towards them fulfilling the journey that they want to go through because we allow them to control their emotions. I think this outweighs anything that anyone else wants to talk about, but social outcomes with government abuse or anything which is necessarily more speculative this is just a very certain slam dunk second argument this is good for people's freedom premise you cannot be free when you are constrained by emotions that sabotage you that you do not want to have that you never controlled the classic example in philosophy is the kleptomaniac right the person who has a compulsion to steal and has a higher order knowledge that they shouldn't steal and they desire not to have that emotion but they have that emotion anyway there are a whole host of reasons why people have these emotions that they never wanted and they know are terrible for them because they were brought up in a chi in a in a household that inculcated those emotions within them that they had a father that told them this this is what a man is. This is how you ought to behave. And this is how you ought to act. And you had that drilled into you since day dot. And that is the why, reason why you have those emotions. Or just biologically, right? When you inherit, for example, your parents' predisposition to depressive tendencies that you never chose in the first place, or advertising and media and 24-7 news that play your emotions like a fiddle in the status quo. There are just a whole series of reasons why people are struggle with these emotions, these outbursts that they know that they do not want to have. And that is something that constrains them because it does not allow them to actually be who they want to be and fulfill the things that they want to fulfill. Analogy here. I think the reason why people think that education is really a precondition for their freedom is because it teaches them things. It allows them to regulate their emotions better. It allows them to integrate into society better, which allows them then to change who they are in order to actually fulfill the person that they did, like they actually want to be, right? They change sort of their lower order desires and the lower order emotions, oh, sorry, lower order emotions and the lower order skills in order to be able to achieve what their higher order self really wants. Or things like SSRI, this is, I think, just a more perfect version of that. It allows people to unlock whole uh, new aspects of their life that they want to claim. This allows people to live the lives that they want to live, to actualize their higher order desire and their plans, and to have control over their body and their emotions, which we think is the most important thing in this debate. We want to unshackle people from the tyranny of biology and the tyranny of emotions that they never chose proud to stand on opening government uh, i want to thank that speaker for your speech uh two practical notes before i get the floor to the leader of opposition firstly if you are uh, an observer or someone out of play please refrain from using the chat and the second thing is even like again this is a final so i can't punish you with like pys piece like talk another pys uh this is a good it's engagement it's nice do it with that being said uh leader of opposition Hi, am I audible? Yeah, I would prefer verbal PYs, please. Be starting in three, two, one. Emotions are what make us fundamentally human, and we cannot allow emotional regulators to turn us inside out. I'm going to bring to you three key arguments about why is it that we shouldn't be supporting these emotional regulators. The first one is that without these emotional regulators, we cannot experience the full richness of human life. Emotions provide us with ways to understand and to process the experiences, the thoughts that we have. Without emotional changes, we lose the ability to understand key aspects of human life, the joy of accomplishment and community, or the sorrow of death and loss, the guilt of behaving badly, the anxiety of doing debate finals, and the curiosity that comes with exploration. All of these are key emotions, but being able to remove them entirely from your existence or to say that I never want to experience this at any point in our life, it's going to far further limit the opportunities and the inspiration that we get from our emotions. And we can't always guarantee and predict for sure that, oh, only this emotion is going to lead me to the best possible outcome or that only happiness and joy is going to lead me to become the best, most successful person or the most creative person. In fact, we see that some of humanity's greatest accomplishments have actually come out of unexpected moments of great sorrow, such as Gandhi witnessing injustice and advancing the movement for unjust independence, such as how inventors have created inventions like the seatbelt to save lives, such as how uh, horrific emotions have led to, for example, uh, the artwork 
works such as The Scream or, or Picasso's Guernica based on witnessing the horrors of war or simply just the complex emotional human state. We argue that all these cases, if they were removed, if people chose to ignore these unhappy emotions because they made them uncomfortable, because they felt that they could achieve more freedom by not feeling these emotions as government says, then I think we run down a very slippery slope of only feeling a certain note. But furthermore, if there's no comparison of opposite emotions, we never experience true happiness or sadness as we have an artificially static baseline. Human experiences therefore become all the same. Whether I had a great day, whether I had a normal day, whether something really catastrophic happened to me, because I can use the regulator to turn off that experience, this therefore strips us of our human will and autonomy because we do not get the true inputs that we do not be get, that we should be getting. We do not get the full impact of grief. We do not get the full impact of fear, of anxiety that sometimes is necessary or sometimes even the full impact of joy for some people. And so we think that therefore it's very important to ensure that people are experiencing a full healthy range of emotion. For example, we see that addiction is often something that society tries to work towards and to avoid because we recognize that addiction limits the fundamental range of emotions that you are able to experience and we want people to be able to experience all sorts of emotions without, uh, without creating this artificial baseline in which they feel these things less strongly and also we fear cases of brain damage where parts of our brains that irregulate the emotions such as the hippocampus are damaged because or the hypothalamus because you do not feel the full range of human behavior so we think that there is already a ways in which we do recognize that even though not all emotions are pleasant that they all have a role to play in enriching our lives that you cannot experience true joy if you do not know what the opposite of joy really is and so they talk to us that oh in key moments you won't turn it off we think that that's not true for a few reasons firstly that you don't, you might not even know that it's important in the first place that perhaps you start off uh, with this emotion and secondly is that you have so much corporate as well as government pressure for you to be using these devices because the corporations can get richer of selling these emotional regulators so you're likely to be pressured even during these very vital life moments to just turn off the negative emotions and to become happy and it's precisely because these terrible tragedies are so often very unexpected in nature, you're not prepared to experience it. That is why you're all the more likely to turn to the regulator to remove these emotions because it comes as an unwelcome shock. That's why you're not really going to grow from these experiences. Secondly, without human emotions, we don't learn from our mistakes. If humanity never feels guilt at genocide or that we do not feel any sort of shame for treating others badly, we risk becoming an amoral species. We can live in addiction-filled loops within our own devices or we can choose to experience the full range of emotions that we are feeling. Emotions are a fundamental biological warning system and a gut check to make us reevaluate how we are doing. That we thought this action was going to create a good outcome for society, but actually it becomes being negative and in fact, sometimes it serves as a sense of self-preservation, such as when we feel fear or disgust. And therefore, the decisions that make us moral and make us good people to others, and now that, that these emotions are removed, your strong incentives to be moral go away. And such as how we see that you, any form of morality or religion, it requires you to feel a sense of good and bad through conscience. But this balance is carefully removed when you have these regulators that are in place. And that we do need to have some sort of negative consequences when people choose to behave in certain ways which are antisocial. Otherwise, we are going to resort uh, otherwise, something is going. Otherwise, things are going to be bad to happen. For example, an individual could say, "I want to remove all guilt in my life so that I could become a sociopathic killer, or that if I'm going to remove all pain in my life, I might not realize when I'm scalding myself and entering a dangerous situation, such as literally stepping into hot water." So we think that even though that um, government claims that people can set goals for themselves and regulate it, we say that it's far easier for people, for example, who are facing anger issues, to regulate themselves and to remove all sorts of shame because it's far easier to change our perceptions of the world than to change the world's perception of us. You can never please anybody, but you sure can please yourself when you choose to use the emotional regulator. And that is why people are likely to take the easy route out. And that is when, when they bring up therapy and SSRIs, we say that all the more people are likely to ignore proper means of help and rather to jump straight to self-medication because the device is far more convenient. That is when they are not going to be addressing the deep-seated issues that they have, but rather are going to make things worse by creating a highly warped version of reality before that i'll take a poi from closing wait so this doesn't make sense to me like how reticent to going and committing mass murders are most mass murderers yeah, so we think that like the average person isn't going to be a mass murderer precisely because they would feel a sense of guilt, shame, anger, horror when they carry out something that's bad. But if you remove these thresholds, if you remove these barriers, that is when you are more, far more likely to engage in such antisocial behavior because you do not fully feel the consequences 
of your behavior on your conscience. And when they talk to us about regulation and price gouging, clearly that's very naive. We argue that even if on the worst case, there's even in on their side, if there's regulation, governments are likely to abuse the regulator to lead to horrific outcomes, such as forcing soldiers to use the regulators to remove any sort of guilt or fear to commit more war crimes. Or you could have Disney encouraging workers to remove all sadness or Amazon encouraging workers to remove a sense of injustice. And these are the kind of abuses that we want to avoid. Avoid. I'm also, uh, and furthermore, as our second speaker will talk about how it's going to hurt social movements and politics and how this is going to worsen freedom because people do not feel the necessary anger to bring about change. And therefore, it's going to further entrench inequality in society, also because people might not necessarily have the access to the regulators. They, there's no guarantee and prop cannot fear that there's going to be free access for these reasons. Very proud to oppose. I want to thank the speaker for the speech. I'd like to now give the floor to the second speaker of opening governments. Here, here. Hi, can I be heard? Yes. Be help, please. So much of our experience is subjected to the whims of what we cannot control. Our biology and the layout of our brains in a way that stops us from actualizing the way in which we do want to exist in this world. In this day and age in particular, and this is a crucial frame, we live in an environment where we experience mass advertising and the advent of social media. A world in which our emotions are constantly manipulated to get us to act against our own interests and fundamental desires, depriving us of the fundamental value we get from meaning and control over our own behavior. The case coming from opening government is remarkably simple. We bring, you a we bring you a direct practical benefit in feeling control and agency over your own behavior, which is independent of whether you achieve any good outcomes. It is enough for us that you are able to control what you do and to feel ownership over this. Secondly, though, we bring you an important principle claim about where it is that value does come from. With this speech, I first want to deal with opening opposition and any potential opposition claims, and then I want to explain why we don't only win on the practical for Maiden, but also on the principle. Four things I want to respond to from opening opposition. Firstly, they say emotions are what make us human. I deeply contest this. Many animals feel emotions, and there is something that are very prevalent within nature. What does make us human is the capacity for planning and the capacity for rational reflection in the life we lead. It is the case that we perceive ourselves as a continuity, and we can decide what it is that we want to be doing and why it is that that is good. We don't merely act on reflex on what we in instinctively desire, but we have the capacity to scrutinize it and decide it why it is good. This will be the core of the principle I bring in the second part of the speech. The second thing I want to respond to is this idea about emotions being fundamental to like the human experience and how you somehow don't get to be happy otherwise. I have two responses to this. Firstly, weirdly enough for opening opposition, and they can't account for this, there are cases where we think it's a good thing to ignore or change your emotions. Cases as simple as someone being told to like ignore their anxiety, or cases where people go on antidepressants, or they decide to get pregnant even though they will experience hormonal imbalances. I think those are all cases where you can see that emotion is not inherently valuable. The second response, however, is that Aidan explains to you that per the info slide, you have the option of controlling the intensity of the device and taking it off completely in cases where you think that feeling a certain emotion is valuable for you. The opposition response here is that they go, ah, you feel uncertainty and irrationality, so you probably don't take it off because you're not rest your rollers. I think I have two responses here. Firstly, if the benefit on side opposition by their own concession is genuinely uncertain, then I think that's a good reason to avoid pursuing it in the first place. Secondly, though, and crucially, opposition shoot themselves in the foot. Feeling anxious about a choice or wanting to avoid experiencing some negative emotion are in themselves emotional states. That is, the reason you're irrational in exactly the way opposition says is because you're subjected to the whims of emotions on their side. On our side, when you do have the thing on, you make good decisions about how you use it exactly because emotions don't interfere with you. 
The last thing I want to deal in way off is this idea about social change coming from opening opposition. Two claims here. Firstly, it's a ridiculously uncertain and speculative argument insofar as I think that society is going to be fundamentally different on both sides. I think it's a very high burden to claim that you're going to get any of those different forms of social control, especially given that the behavior of actors is going to change in many different ways they can project. Secondly, though, things like propaganda, especially for soldiers, is just symmetric. We see brainwashing happen. I don't think that this thing changes, especially when you can take it on and off. On to the principal claim and why we win. First burden, I want to prove why it is that freedom and control are both distinct from and more important than the emotions you experience in your life. First claim for this is, is that this is because emotions are intuitively not good in themselves. I want to give you a quick thought experiment here. Obviously, there are many cases where we do experience valuable emotions. However, imagine a situation much like what Owo discusses, in which someone injects me with heroin. My brain is flooded with dopamine and I experience one of the happiest moments in my life. At the same time, though, suppose I have an intense desire not to be addicted to this heroin. Intuitively, there's something very wrong and twisted about this form of happiness. The claim here is simple. Happiness in itself is not enough to create value. It is not a sufficient condition. Something more is needed. Secondly, though, I want to prove why it's not a necessary condition either. There are situations of intense pain that we nevertheless consider to be some of the most valuable in people's lives. Consider the case of a soldier sacrificing themselves for the sake of their comrades, or that of a mother giving up her life for that of her child. Opposition will try to twist these examples and claim that these are somehow instances of doing something because of how you feel. Note, however, how perverse this claim is. Opposition, in doing so, is dismissing the intensity of the suffering the individual is going through. The reason these examples are considered heroic and valorous isn't because you're being driven by emotion, but rather because the people do these things despite the pain and suffering they're going through, despite the internal uncertainty they face. I think that this demonstrates then that happiness or emotions are not required for value either. It's not a necessary or a sufficient condition. At this point then, utility and happy chemicals cannot be what you judge this debate on. The question then is, how do we derive value? And I think I'm going to prove why this is true. Emotions are good just in the case we want to experience them. And I want to note two ways in which this is useful. I think that the source of value is the freedom of control over your own life and your actions and in instances where you can rise above those rational limitations. Two claims here. Firstly, on why this wins, it is independent of actually achieving those desires. Intuition, even when you fail, there's something intuitively valuable about getting to do things your own way, about not being impeded or controlled by others and living an authentic life that you claim control over. It's the most certain impact in this debate. And that POI from closing, sure. Chris, why do you think this is a free choice? I think that the thing is that even though you may claim that you don't have a free choice initially, I think your mind is cleared from all the things that impede you in Aiden's case, be it social media, be it biological predispositions, be it parts of your upbringing you don't get control, those things you're released from the first moment you put the device on. Crucially, the motion presupposes the device is used in the first place. I think what this means then is that the world in which people don't use the device is a world in which people don't actualize. We get to presume that they do, and they have at least one moment of clarity. So on to the weighing. First one then is what I just said. The idea that this is certain, and I think that the control over your life is one of the most important feelings. The converse intuition is clear. Even if you could get the opportunity to live a happy life, if you're being pampered and had no control, there's something deeply wrong and patronizing about this. Secondly, panel, and note this though, desires are responsive to rational thought in a way that emotions are not. What I mean by this is that our desires change when we decide if we want to have them. This means that things like empathy still arise in that the reason you feel empathy is because you're a moral being. You realize that you want to pursue your own goals and that this means you should respect those of others. We win both on the practical, but crucially on the principle. I'm very proud to propose. I want to thank the speaker for speech. And before the, I'll give the floor to the deputy leader of opposition. I'll quickly turn on my lights, and then the deputy leader can take the the spots. And we. Uh, deputy leader of opposition, whenever you're ready. Can you hear me? Yes.
First, this technology is unlikely to be exceptionally accessible. Their argument is there will be caps on price gouging because governments want to destigmatize this technology. Three responses. One, engaging in caps on pricing reduce the incentives to produce and distribute this technology, which is presumably very expensive to create. Governments do not want to have this happen. As a consequence, what governments will feel pressure to do is subsidize this technology. But governments do not have infinite pools of money. Raising taxes or redirecting healthcare expenditure toward a new and speculative technology is likely to not have political capital. Second, politicians in many cases do not like this technology because politicians often rile up emotions of people in order to win elections rather than to pass positive policy. Now, GovBench might argue, this is great, the emotion regulator helps moderate politics more. But our argument is, politicians will intentionally, therefore, not make it as accessible as it was and encourage stigma against it because that allows them an easier way to win pathways to election. But third, most governments are scared to alienate powerful pharma and technology companies that have substantial influence over things like health policy. Why is it likely that this will be inaccessible? The key claim is monopoly power. These will involve high fixed R&D costs, creating substantial incentives to patent this technology, giving you monopoly power. Crucially, the process of innovating this technology is hard. One, this was an extremely high risk project to begin with. No technology like this exists. This isn't like an SSRI. It's literally a wearable device that can regulate your emotions. This high chance of failure, as well as repetitive failures, means you have to price in that risk. Second, you probably experienced many failures over and over, which in turn and exemplify your costs. And third, attracting smart scientists to work on such a speculative project, redirecting resources within what's probably already a profitable pharmaceutical or tech company, in turn took large amounts of costs that you have to make up, therefore you will engage in substantial pricing. Furthermore, the demand for this technology will often be inelastic among the users. The argument here is people are likely to be addicted to the emotion regulator for a number of structural reasons. One, when people use it, each people period where they remove the regulator feels totally different. It requires a readjustment process. As proposition concedes, people move out of using coping mechanisms. They stop trying to go to anger management classes. They stop going to therapy or SSRIs. So removing the regulator makes them feel much worse, makes them feel like they want to have the regulator back which in turn addicts them to the regulator when they initially use it. Second, it is often designed in an addictive way. Obviously, people have some control over the controls of the regulator, but the specifics of the technology or the way it regulates your emotion are still up to the corporation, and the corporation has incentives to try to optimize the technology to be as addictive as possible. Third, their very own claim on advertising. Advertising is incredibly effective from corporations to get people to use this technology to begin with without thinking through the implications of whether using this technology will prevent them from being addicted to it. This has two implications. One, it means people want to go out of using this technology. So what will corporations do? Plan obsolescence. For example, make the technology expire like an iPhone does to force you to buy a new one or make constant payments to the technology, which in turn cause you to pay a lot of money and jack up the price. And second, this, this demand, this inelastic demand also weakens their claim on freedom because their whole argument is, Freedom is empowering. You have the choice to make this choice for yourself. But if you're locking in your future self, who does not have complete psychological continuity with you, you are constraining your ability to ever make a choice like this in the future, their own principle of freedom is overwhelmingly flipped by this argument. Let's talk about people's mental health. People's mental health substantially worsens on average. And this is not a claim merely about utility. It accesses proposition's impact of freedom. If people find it harder to escape either excessive mental trauma like PTSD, or in more normal cases, find it harder to escape their emotions, to escape stress in their everyday life, there's a constraint on freedom. And crucially, I'm not just talking about the freedom who do of people who do use the regulator. I'm also talking about the freedom of people who don't. Many people don't use the regulator. This is people who can't afford the regulator. This is people who are afraid afraid of using the emotional regulator because it's a new technology that generates a reasonable amount of fear. The idea that your emotions will be controlled often generates things like conspiracy theories that makes you think this is not a technology that can be trusted. Furthermore, stigma against mental health is substantially stronger in the case of this regulator than one, something like SSRI, since you can at least compare SSRIs to drugs, but two, more relevantly, things like therapy, because therapy doesn't feel like it's changing who you are as a person, so it's much harder to fear monger about it. Critically, the people who are least likely to use this technology consequently are people who are less educated who are poorer both because they can't afford it and because they are less open to new technologies less likely to hear about them less likely to access them among these people their autonomy is actively weakened the thesis of our claim here is alternate routes to preserve mental health like therapy like ssris are substantially less accessible and less likely to be developed in their world 
I acknowledge there are a number of burdens to this argument, which I will fulfill. Burden one, there is currently substantial investment in things like SSRIs and cognitive behavioral therapy. This is one, due to strong political incentives when people are more productive and less unhappy with them. And second, strong market incentives. Many different SSRIs work. Therapy is not a single technology. You can't patent it. There is competition to do things like drive prices down. No, these incentives are asymmetric. The emotional regulator has immediate electoral outcomes for governments in ways that SSRIs don't. It's not a new innovation. It's an unexpired patent. So a subsidy is much less expensive. So this political incentive exists for SSRIs and stuff, but it doesn't knife any of our previous claims on why governments are unlikely to be able to subsidize this. Second burden, this is key to reducing a lot of these investments. People with education and money are able to move to this regulator as their preferred technology. Proposition argues that currently, this technology will be seen as better, as more accessible. This means the level of demand from people who can pay the most money substantially reduces. It also reduces political pressure on governments to do things like subsidize therapy or more likely to do things like innovate, to spend money on SSRI innovation that benefits rich people as well, especially since people with wealth and political privilege are more likely to be the kinds of people who, for instance, have political power, have connections with the government and so on. They are less likely to push for innovation. SSRIs and therapy have substantial scope for improvement. There's a lot of research happening. There's lots of investment going there. This investment goes away. This argument outweighs their claims on freedom, on reducing crime, on fighting addiction. Why? Because a large number of people don't access those benefits. Even if the regulator is better in the short term, one, it's unclear it remains better in the long term. And two, in the near term, the people who don't use the regulator just have to go to a slightly worse alternative. On their side, a lot of people are left with nothing to control their emotions, nothing to control their decision making process. Another effect on other individuals is social movements. Recognize that helping others, collectivization is costly. It requires taking time and effort. In many cases, you default to not collectivizing. Anger and frustration are powerful motivators to turn out and collectivize. It's probably irrational for any one individual to turn out and collectivize, but we, we want people making that irrational decision to solve the coordination problem. But when you experience a microaggression and you use the regulator, the most influential people in social movements are often turned off from engaging in political activism. This substantially weakens the political system as well. Happy to oppose. Uh, I want to thank that speaker for speech and closing opening half. And this with sadness in my heart that I have to remind everyone again to please do offer and take PYs because they create a lot of engagements and make things more comparative. It's very nice. And we're going to use it against you in close comparisons. That being said, I would like to now give the floor to the member of government here, here. Uh, can you hear and see me okay? Yes. Okay. Which moments of your life are the ones on which you need a hand on your shoulder? This debate is about where is this technology used at its core? If we prove that it's used in the most important instances, then that should be enough to win us the debate. We'll also give you a principle just for fun. Firstly, why is this technology not used constantly and why is it used well? Opening government flag that you will want to feel some emotions, like you go to your dad's funeral and you might want to cry. That doesn't seem to explain why you want to feel them more than you'll want to stop how hard it feels in that moment, how you want to stop yourself from crying, how you've been socialized to stop yourself from crying. The emotional calculus is something that just has not been answered for. Why will it be balanced in such a way that you use it in reasonable manners? Meaningfully, OG never answered this question. We will be nuanced and explain why people use it reasonably and not constantly. Firstly, the value of these emotions that you feel is very relevant to your life. You want to relate to things like your friends and the emotions that they have, the experiences that they have. You want to be empathetic and have a hand on their shoulder. And meaningfully, think about it this way, right? How weird does it feel to you when a friend of yours had an experience, a breakup or something like that, and you can't actually offer them support that is not just related on like trying to sympathize with them. You struggle much more. You feel as if you aren't being useful to them. So the value of those emotions is very relevant to your life. And so that's going to suggest to you why you would act in this way and want to feel some emotions. Secondly, if opening opposition is right and most people can't use it, then you would seem weird when in, the, in social situations and you seem robotic. You're weird when you're somebody who is not actually feeling emotions. So that again disincentivizes you from it. Thirdly, the root cause of the emotion does not go away, right? You still feel scared. You still feel like hopeless. You still feel the grief of somebody around you dying. So the root cause of the emotion does not go away and you want other people to relate. 
So game theoretically you will not suppress because you do not want other people to suppress. Fourth, this does not exist since the beginning of time, right? Obviously you've been socialized and brought up in a world in which emotions are both felt and normalized. What does this mean? Firstly, you have a fear of this. How will I feel? You think about how people look at people on SSRIs, how scared you are of going on an SSRI and thinking how will I feel if I don't feel an emotion in a certain moment and how scary it is to feel your brain chemistry being changed. It's the same way that we also do things like shaming people who don't cry at funerals or looking at people as sociopaths. We make them feel terrible and ask how they are crying. That social fear of stigma is one of the big reasons why you fear using this too much and so you're going to only use it in important circumstances. But also, I would trivially say that emotions are one of the things that make life worth living. Things that are as beautiful as love. Things that are as beautiful as experiencing the irrational stupid joy of walking into like a grocery store and seeing Polish milk and being remarkably happy about it for some stupid reason. The thing is that there's so many silly stupid things in our life that give us irrational joy, which is a part and parcel of what makes life worth living. Movies and TV tell us that that's what makes life worth living. So that's why you pursue to live it this way. Leader of opposition preempts this by saying that you have corporate incentives to constantly use this. But you don't make per use money, right? So that is obviously a silly claim. This shows you why you're going to be incentivized to use it well. What does this mean? Firstly, people will use this in a balanced way. They do not see this as a catch-all with full appeal. You use this in important situations for you. And secondly, that people's innate reticence to this means that you see this in the important situations. What is the alternative? OG say that you go to therapy or use SSRIs, which opening opposition does a reasonable job of rebutting. But the issue is that that's true of only a tiny portion of the population. The most common thing is emotional repression because you want to look calm and seem big and strong. Opening governments say to this that you might just like go and be an alcoholic. Most people I don't think are alcoholics. What is far more common and larger on scale is you use this to repress your emotions. You stop yourself from crying. You hold yourself back. Why is that so bad? Firstly, it's a vicious cycle because you feel guilty to yourself for not allowing yourself to feel an emotion. You think that you're weak because you have to hold yourself back because you weren't strong enough in the first place. And so you feel more guilty, so you feel that emotion even more, and that makes you feel far more destroyed. If you put on the regulator in that moment, that stops you from feeling the root emotion that starts that vicious cycle. So instead, even in the moments when you do eventually feel your emotion, you feel them in better and more reasonable ways. But secondly, you keep your support structures around you more. On st in status quo, when you repress yourself, you often do things like lashing out at people unwittingly. When you see somebody feeling emotions, you're like, oh, that person is weak. Because if I were to see that that person is not weak, then I have to accept that I am that way too. So then that means that you treat people badly. You push them away more when they offer you support. You do things like lashing out at people at work when they randomly say something to you. So on our side of the house, you keep your support system around you much more because you're less likely to alienate them. This is a lower burden argument than opening government for why you do not destroy yourself. What does this mean? Firstly, we've addressed the opening opposition idea that you get addicted to use because people are far more reasonable in this. But secondly, the opening government principle is reliant on the idea that people use it fairly because if not, OO was right. You're not free. You're more constrained. We enable this more. So we unlock this argument. The OG claim does not work without this. I very quickly want to address why this is likely to be cheap. And I know that opening government needs to depend on this because if people can't afford it, they cannot get the benefits OG talks about. Firstly, there's economies of scale. You spread out the manifest factoring costs across a large number of units. Secondly, innovation. The costs are likely to be reduced because there's large demand for it, as we've already said, and there's an incentive for there to be more producers. Teja says, it is hard, so therefore you monopolize, which the rest of the mechs I would note are reliant on. Check your notes. But it is also uniquely profitable, so then people will enter the market more. AI is also very difficult. Like Teja says, it is also very speculative at the start, but it gets less speculative as it is adopted at scale, so more investors come in. But also, the biggest instances where it is applied, right, are ones where the state has an incentive to provide it, which it does because things like rehabilitation, the criminal justice system, and all of those things are far more useful and far more successful when you can do this regulation. I think crime is enough to solve this problem, right? Rehabilitation is so much easier. So even if Tejas is right around everything around SSRIs being held back, I don't care because we stop massive degrees of crimes as a result of this, which we have now proven. Opening opposition, please. Yeah, none of your claims on scale matters. Our point is this technology will be patented. It's extremely high risk. Other players entering won't meaningfully lower the price. You don't explain the economies of scale point beyond merely saying it. Why won't you okay, just you, shut okay, out okay, all your Okay, okay, got it. I'm cutting you off, Tejas. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting you off. You did this in the last round too. Yeah, the issue is, right, that you, firstly, if, just because you patent it doesn't mean that people can't start to emulate the same technology. There's probably some kind of root discovery that enables this kind of thing to happen the same way that the one AGI model does not prevent other AGI models from existing. I think that the rest of this probably Lucy can deal with if it's important. Let's talk about why this is principally just. O stands over the instrumentalization of people on scale. They say we should do things like create beautiful art, or to be fair to them, they say it's good or for broad societal change for us to have collective guilt, or emotions should exist for the sake of social change. Let's say this is true. Why is it unjust even if this is the case? It is using people's emotions as a means 
means to an end. Why is that principally unjust? Firstly, nobody else experiences this pain. Only you do. Society might benefit, but you individually are harmed and that is not fair. That is why you on intuition would not be comfortable living in a society which is perfect and utopian but relies on the suffering of one person alone because that one person experiences the suffering and none of the benefit. But secondly, people are ends in themselves. Each person is morally deserving of their own joy. It is unjust to sacrifice that for their sake. It is unjust for you to kill one person to give their five organs to five other people. So even if it is utile, it is clearly more valuable to sacrifice utility for the sake of each person's individual joy. I know the end point of OG is agency, but it is us that prove that that agency is possible because you're not using the means to an end. Compare these things. Telling people to choose one of a hundred cakes, which is agency maximizing, as opposed to giving them one very sour cake, is clearly not as important as taking away the option of only one person to eat a poisoned cake to save a village from capture. We're the only ones who give people meaningful joy that should be enough to win the debate. I want to thank that speaker for the speech and maybe to make a clarification about POI just to make sure that this doesn't happen again. According to the EUC manual, you have up to 15 seconds to actually ask a POI, but it also states that if the person cuts you off, then you are being cut off. If that is done being unreasonable to the extent you can't make the point, then we as judges won't take it into consideration as interaction. Um, but yeah, that's just a clarification. If you are being cut off, then you should stop talking. That being said, without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to the member of opposition. Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> One extension from closing opposition, the existence of the emotional regulator is terrible for political activism. There are broadly two scenarios in which this debate applies. One, reasonably democratic countries, and secondly, countries without significant democratic protections. I will go through both in turn and explain why this significantly undermines social progress, filling in the gaps of the literal 22nd DLO argument. Firstly, on reasonably democratic countries, a couple of steps to this argument. Step one, why is this adopted in underprivileged communities, like for example, under-resourced black and brown communities? There are a couple of things to point out. One, opening government concedes that governments will place price caps on this technology, meaning that there's good reason to believe that it could be accessible in some cases. And even if DLO is right that it's not broadly accessible, governments have specific incentives to subsidize this technology in these communities because it's the path of least resistance for these governments to do, i.e. you want to placate people to a more significant extent. But secondly, this technology, especially over time, is likely to be normalized. So even if DLO is right that it's not widely accessible in the immediate term, over time, people get used to the existence of this technology. It develops economies of scale. And this is especially true in underprivileged communities where significant amounts of intergenerational trauma exist and neglect by the state means that you're more likely to suffer from mental health conditions like depression. Step two, why do underprivileged communities use this to a significant extent? The reason for this is relatively straightforward. It is the path of least resistance to use the emotional regulator rather than alternatives because it is much easier to do that, i.e. check out of the negative emotions that you are feeling because of the way that the state is neglecting you to a more significant extent. The third thing to point out is that you're unlikely to be able to use alternatives either for the reason that in many cases there is stigma that is surrounding the idea of going to therapy to a more significant extent. What then is the alternative? The most likely alternative is that you instead agitate the government to do things like subsidize welfare for your community, agitate to stop things like gerrymandering, agitate to provide higher quality education to your community. And here's the thing. I know I said above in this argument that you will choose the path of least resistance, but the difference is when you don't have access to the emotional regulator and you similarly likely do not have access to significant amounts of therapy or significant amounts of SSRIs, you default to the suboptimal option, i.e. protesting, because you have no other choice. And we can see empirically in the status quo, the rise of many progressive social movements to a more significant extent, agitating against the very injustices that we are identifying. Step five, why are these alternatives successful? There are two particular things to point out. One, it may be true that these communities do not have significant amounts of economic capital, but they certainly have significant amounts of political capital. There are a couple of illustrations of this. One, you can form large amounts of voting blocks. Think about how many interracial coalitions exist in different progressive social movements. And moreover, 
politicians on the left have strong incentives to cater to to a more significant extent. See, for example, like the Workers' Party in Brazil, and they can play kingmaker in parliament in order to get concessions for you to a more significant extent. But secondly, when you protest to a more significant extent, you have the capacity to get others on your side. And this is especially true because there has been a rise of social media. Individuals are gradually growing more empathetic to one another. And the structural reason for this is that you are exposed to different perspectives, which over time makes you tolerant of other views, which means that even people from relatively more privileged classes are gradually more likely to empathize with your cause and donate to your cause to a more significant extent. See the outpouring of donations that happened to the BLM movement in 2020. And note that this argument is like has a relatively low bar to clear for the reason that even if you don't think that on our side of the house, the protests that we encourage get like national change, we still are more likely to get things like local changes. Like for example, agitating to ensure that the government improves the local quality of the water that is provided to your community to a more significant extent. And that is sufficient for us to access our impacts. Scenario two, why will this be terrible in less democratic and auto democratic countries. And again, there are a couple of steps to this argument. Step one, why will the state control the usage of this technology? PM explicitly says that there will be government oversight on the usage of this technology. If this is true, then governments will have strong incentives to control the usage of this technology, and they can manipulate it in the way they want. So for example, they can steal the IP from Western tech companies and then use that same IP to make their own versions of the emotional regulator, which they can manipulate. Step two, why can states manipulate the usage of this technology in harmful ways? One, obviously, Obviously, you can hack this technology to dictate what emotion customization options are already available to you to a more significant extent. Secondly, presumably the state can do things like nudging. So for example, program in reminders when it de detects that you're relatively angry and going to resist the state and say, hey, no, you should ensure emotional stability to a more significant extent so you don't agitate against us. Burden three is relatively obvious. Obviously, you have incentives to placate people against resisting against you because that is the easiest thing for you to do. Step four. Why is the emotional regulator a uniquely bad way to placate people relative alternatives that such autocratic states would use, like propaganda and media control? One, alternatives are easier for individuals to question. So for example, even in autocratic states which have significant amounts of media control, individuals can do things like use VPNs to access things that the state is doing. And then they're like, wow, the state is lying to me through its propaganda. I want to protest to a more significant extent. But secondly, not every autocratic state is like China with absolute control. It can also look like a case like Zambia, where you don't have totalizing amounts of resources to a more significant extent. Finally, why are alternatives preferable? And here you can apply the analysis that I gave in the first part of my extension, i.e. the idea that protests gradually get the state scared. Before I more fully explain this argument, OG. Yeah, so the whole clash on accessibility relies on information that's not in the motion, like whether there is competition in the market or not. The success of social movements relies on a whole series of random factors that no one can predict. OG should win alone on the certain impact that millions of people no longer suffer from depression, outbursts of anger. Okay, so and there's this really anti-intellectual trend in debating, which is like anything that seems high burden is automatically a bad or annoying argument. Teams are allowed to give fucking likelihood analysis for what is going to happen. And this is probably good for the activity because it increases intellectual progress and ideas that we find socially acceptable. Alternatives are better because even if the state has totalizing control, they're scared that you've already opened Pandora's box, i.e. some protests happen, you challenge the appearance of authority of the state, and then future protests happen to more significant extent. The implication of this material is simple. Fewer protections for ethnic minorities. You don't cater to the material needs of minorities within particular states to improve your conditions. The way you strategically position this material is number one, it outweighs the opening opposition material of states using this in bad ways because it's higher margin, i.e. their material only applies to soldiers who are probably already patriotic, whereas our material has a higher margin on social movements. Secondly, we prove the necessary burdens for the material to function. And thirdly, it outweighs the OG material on how it improves individuals' mental conditions because a precondition is being able to, for example, be alive and not oppressed by the state. We gradually reduce the likelihood that that oppression happens. I want to thank that speaker for the speech. I'd like to give the floor to the last speaker of GovBench, the government whip. Here, here. Okay, uh, I think something's wrong with my camera. Uh, let me see. Okay, good. Uh, can you see me? And can... Yes, we can see and hear you. Okay. Okay. 
First, I'm going to respond to closing up, and I'm going to talk about how it's likely going to be used, lastly, and on the benefits that we are uniquely accessing on our side. First, on closing opposition, the first thing I would point out that the instrumentalization principle that Vaji gives you still works against closing opposition. That is, that we still explain that you should not be instrumentalizing people's emotions in order to get more like higher, uh, uh, higher, higher societal benefits. But secondly, I know that the explanation that we gave that was unengaged with about how it's going to be used presumably applies to poor communities as well. That is that this, for the same reasons, you will not want to be robotizing yourself, especially in communities that might be ec like economically deprived where emotional connections and the experience of emotions is seen as particularly valuable. The only thing they have on that is hacking, which like, uh, you know, a high burden arguments like, Good, great, but this is actually a really high burden argument, right? Like, especially if it's widely used by loads of different people. Like, I don't know how this insane hacking would be working, why no one would be possibly whistleblowing that. I think it's insane and they really would have to explain that. Fourthly, if they are conceding that the people have political capital, then I think that lots of this would probably be done Regardless, because if they have political capital and it would be some kind of political party that would want to be appealing on the same group, regardless. But finally, what are the emotions that would make you completely content if you are being oppressed? I just want to point out that there are things like material suffering and things like that that are even independent of emotions, right? For example, if you are feeling hunger, if you want to own things and stuff like that, those are still reasons to be discontent regardless, meaning that the impetus to be collectivizing presumably happens regardless. I would in fact say that it could happen better because at the point when you perhaps are not experiencing really irrational anger, then you might have better ways in which you are doing that collectivization, i.e. you can strategize better, you can form those coalitions better, you can make decisions that are going to get you the goal easier. That deals with closing opposition. Let's talk about how it's going to be used. I think we gave several important clarifications. The first one, really importantly, is that this is not a this house be first, right? This has not been available since the beginning of time. This has been invented in the context of the world that we are existing in now. And I want you to reality check how any of you would feel about using this device excessively right now. Opening opposition thinks that emotions are making us human. I, I don't know if this is true or not, but the people will be clearly thinking about it that way. That is, it would feel really weird if the things that are currently, for instance, making you sad, like films that are making you sad because it's really touching, would suddenly give you no emotional reaction at all. So you'll be probably deeply weirded out and quite reluctant to be using it in a really excessive way because the feeling of feeling really different would be weird and scary. And secondly, like we feel emotions, it's the same emotion in different ways, it can be positive or negative, right? Like you can feel the nice sadness when you see like some sad, sad video and it makes you feel sad and it's touching but you also can feel the bad sadness and people would not want to be using it super excessively in situation when it's unnecessary because you might be limiting the things that the, the nice version of the emotion as well as the bad one this is the first reason why it would be used relatively well the second thing is again if opening opposition is correct and it would not be used by a wide range of population we explain that even the people who would be using it would not be making huge substantial changes. And this is the, the, this is additional deterrent. Like you, you would feel weird and people would think that you are weird. You would massively struggle in social situation because you would remove yourself from understanding and empathy to others. This all explains why it would not be used excessively and it will be used specifically in situations when it will be particularly relevant. Some of the ones that OG points out but doesn't deal with the comparative harms that always tries to push on them. This then explains why the initial choice to use it continuously would be thought through. This in underlines the OG's principle of choice because it needs to be rational and fair and done well in order for it to matter. But secondly, it's much better than the OG justification, which is that once you use it, you will be rational then. Because if you put it on and then perhaps you remove things like fear, then you wouldn't know that you would be fearing the use of the thing otherwise, right? So it needs to be explained why it would be rational at the beginning before you start using it. What then uh, opening opposition has left? There's a weird thing about like, you will have less investment in SSRIs. 
they say that the reason why it's not going to be accessible is because governments don't want to be hurting big pharma that provides SSRIs. But then they claim that it will make SSRIs unprofitable. It presumably hurts big pharma. I think they needed to have picked one of these things. Both of them probably can't really happen. I think we also dealt with their whole think about inaccessibility and why it's likely going to be accessible for the economies of scale and for the fact that you are likely to be able to adapt to the root technology that also responds to the think about hacking because you probably have different providers who are able to supply that technology so you can deal with some kind of massive macro hacking so i think that the conclusion of that is that i think it's going to be reasonably widely accessible but it's also going to be used in a rational way in instances where it is really important i want to take opening opposition before i talk about uh, the benefits 15 seconds. Even if they can effort, we totally prove low-income people experience more stigma against the regulator. You don't prove there are economies of scale. We show addiction among users once they start using, which locks in and reduces accessibility. This is a huge impact. Demonstrate CEO's claim on underprivileged people being willing to use it is a knife and heavily mitigates your case. Yeah, I think that CEO is knifing. This is true. I think we already also responded to the idea about addiction, because I think that given that it's possible to be taking that off and you have experienced the emotions that you are blocking before. I think you still have the coping mechanisms. Plus, there are obviously the additional incentive that we described about emotion, like you know, the emotional experience that will prevent you from using it consistently. Uh, let's talk about the benefits. I think first, we do we, yeah, we are underlining where it's going to be used in specific cases where it's really needed, i.e. the prevent like in, in instances where you have to, when you have mental health problems or where you're trying to resist impulses. But I would also know that even if you don't buy most of it, and if you buy the entire thing about where it's going to be accessible and always correct, and it's just like no one is going to be able to use it beyond the really rich people, we point out that there is a very clear incentive by the state to be using at least in the context of criminal justice, for instance, right? Because certainly the this technology must be definitely cheaper than the provision of the, 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 the than the prolonged provision in things like prisons and the rehabilitative methods that you need to be using there that are often unsuccessful. Plus, you have massive direct economic incentives because of the financial benefits if you are able to limit crime. So if all is completely right, we at least have this left because this is clearly a financial ben financial beneficial thing for the state to do. Plus, it's a insanely high benefit in terms of being able to prevent impulses, providing rehabilitation, pre pre preventing violence. All of that is in and of itself a big benefit. I'm proud of the course. I want to thank the speaker for the speech. I'd like to give, <clears throat> give the floor to the last speaker of closing opposition here, here. At the end of this debate, I guess we kind of agree with opening opposition. To be human is to feel sad, happy, angry, upset. The unpredictability, the uncontrollability, that which is relative. Opening government wanted it in this debate for you to remove people from the tyranny of biology. But instead, they sentenced them to a worse form of enslavement, to constant numbness, to being hollow, possessed, out of control subjects of states who lose any incentive to improve the reality of life for people. Panel, you must be imaginative about what happens in a world where this technology exists in the long run, not just tomorrow, not just when it's still expensive, into perpetuity, where everyone now just has a chip sitting in their head and are expected to regulate themselves just like all forms of technology that have become normalized. So I'm gonna start by explaining then why our extension, if proven, clearly wins the debate. First of all, why it beats opening government and closing government. Both of them have the same impact in this debate, yeah? Both of them are going for the idea that you can optimize your life. The problem with this impact, though, is that, yeah, maybe you can optimize your life, 
but their impact does not change the underlying utility potential that a given individual has. That is to say, they don't raise the ceiling or increase the floor, but government policy can. It can change the underlying conditions that people are able to access, the neighborhoods that they live in, the capital that invests in them, the kinds of opportunities that they have and their future generations have. Maybe you risk some unhappiness on our side of the house, but you can get much larger amounts of happiness for more people in the long run by getting the form of change that they kill. Secondly, social protections are obviously more important for infinitely more people than any of the three other teams' impacts in the debate. Opening opposition's impact, they're telling you to vote for you because fewer poor people are getting SSRIs. Our case is about why poor people don't get the development that they need because of what governments can do with this technology. We needed such a better response to there. But thirdly, it flips opening government's principle on choice much more effectively than they do. Why is this the case? Because OJ's principle on choice is such a narrow principle of choice. It is the choice that you have over your emotions. The form of choice that is being denied to people on their side of the house is the right to live, is the ability to experience utility is the right to experience any form of meaningful choice that transcends the choice that we should have over our emotions. So all I need to do is take down the responses we've heard to our extension, and we should go through cleanly through this debate. What responses do we get from Lucy? They were pretty weird. The first thing that she says is, well, look at our case. People are still going to use it rationally. I'll get to them, get to that when I get to them. But unfortunately, they didn't respond to our mechanism, which is that the state, both in autocratic and democratic societies, would likely have high oversight about how this would be implemented in any context. So it doesn't matter if people want to use it well. We explain why the state was perversely incentivized to do it in ways that killed the kind of activism that would change them. Secondly, they throw out this random moral intuition that it's literally just words, that we shouldn't instrumentalize people. Do you know what that sentence means? Both people on this debate are being instrumentalized in some way. Either they're instrumentalizing their emotions or we're instrumentalizing their economic prospects, yeah? So that's not a real response to our argument. They needed to explain why their form of instrumentalization was worse or better than ours was. We explained why it wasn't above. Thirdly, they say that people still feel hunger, but at least now they're going to be rational. Sure, maybe on our side of the house, you know, you still care about the bare minimums, but unfortunately our case wasn't just about the bare minimums, yeah? It's not just about hunger, it's about economic development, social <coughs> mobility, and the ability for people to advance themselves, and so this was a pretty uncharitable response. But also when they see that it's better because people are now not irrational, Poor people aren't irrational. The problem and the reason activism doesn't succeed isn't because they are irrational, uh, it's because they aren't angry enough and because on your side, you numb them. And the final, the final attempt that they give you to try us, take us out of the round is to say, ah, oh, but you've knifed your opening, so we got you guys, you don't actually have a case. Look, guys, I think we just approached this debate a lot better than our opening did because we assumed that this technology would be feasible and we approached, even if it was not widely accessible, even in the proportions that it was used, our impacts actually occur and we explained why states would have an incentive to do that. So then, Let's deal then with the only thing that challenges this, which is closing government's material about why people will use it well. What are their reasons for this? They're all just sentences, right? Waji says you have friends and you want to feel pain. Why? This is just asserted twice. These are the most painful experiences that people experience in their lives. Why are people emotionally mature enough to know that it's okay to not avoid pain? Why would they want to experience these things? Why wouldn't they become addicted? Just saying that there are norms which exist does not account for the fact that social norms change over long periods of time and change the very fabric of society. So think about, for instance, how society has become addicted to the internet, ads, soon artificial intelligence. We think at some point it will be cheap and everyone is expected to do this. But more importantly, we gave you reasons why governments had incentives to push this and coerce it onto people. And so I just don't think it's true that them saying social norms and people optimize as well gets their benefit. But secondly, we explained that people are pretty poor at calibrating how to use the regulator, because how do you know how much of your emotions to regulate? They never explained why people actually have the capacity to make decisions well. But thirdly, we explained it would precisely be people in the worst off situations in the poorest communities who would want to use this technology, whose lives are so worse off that it would be important that they numb themselves somehow to avoid the kind of change that we say would happen on our side of the house. So it's just not true that people use this in their great way. And even if it was, it undercuts all of government's utility impacts. So I don't even know why they want to say this. So I think that concretely explains why our extension is true and it wins the debate. But Aiden, I want to hear what you have to say. 
So at very best, opposition bench proves some marginal wins on utility. We explain why freedom from internal no, restraints is a no, necessary no, no. That, condition. But that's where you're wrong, Aiden. You, it's not just about utility and choice. And here's where we where you draw a pretty unhazy binary, right? So sure, you give people the choice to determine their emotions a little bit more. But max extension explains why you strip away a very important form of choice, which is the choice that emerges from the capability to control your own emotions and change the society you, you live in. Finally, then, why do we beat opening opposition? I think they remove themselves from the debate through their deputy leader of opposition strategy because their case cannot be true, right? Their second case cannot be true because if it's not accessible for the vast majority of the population, if that's true, why wouldn't there still be demand for SSRIs if that's the majority of the population, yeah? So their case is pretty unclear, but I just think we bring you a much more important impact, yeah? Maybe they're correct that there must might be some less SSRIs that exist in society. I'm sorry, we just don't care as much as our impact, which is about how the entire fabric of societies change as a result of this policy. I think at the end of the top half clash about whether or not using this technology increases or decreases your utility or numbs you or what, it is so unclear whether or not you would achieve a better optimization. But you know, on their side, for the most vulnerable people, you lower the absolute value of utility that people can achieve and heart and hamper the kind of social advancement we want in society. I'm so proud to stand in closing opposition.